Hey everyone, welcome to Sneaker Details. I'm Infidel Castro, but that's really not important. What is important is that today we'll be taking a trip down the rabbit hole that is sneaker journalism to investigate what is possibly the most poorly marketed and documented shoe Nike has ever released, the Nike Daybreak. A shoe whose origins seem to confuse not only most sneaker commentators, but even Nike themselves. So, let's see if we can do this without me swearing. <laughs> Looking back on 2019, there's no denying it was a strong year for Nike's vintage running silhouettes. Cheetos Abbey's silhouette fusing collabs finally dropped, Nike's Netflix Stranger Things tie-in turned the tailwind inside out and upside down, and Yun Takahashi uncovered a new take on an old Japanese favourite, the Daybreak. Each of these releases generated a considerable amount of press, both before and after release. And with these silhouettes now firmly etched into the sneakerhead psyche, the Sakai LD Waffle and the Undercover Daybreak would go on to feature in many of the best of lists for 2019. Their unique designs and vibrant colourways providing a footnote to the deconstruction and reimagining so prevalent in fashion at the end of the last decade. But something about the sneaker media coverage of these two shoes and Nike's marketing of these releases didn't quite sit right, and as time passed it became more apparent that much of the reference information being associated with these two models was either wrong or in some cases just made up. So, in an attempt to at least settle the argument going on in my head, I decided to check some of these facts and see if I could ascertain exactly what was going on here. And what I found was, at best, a trail of journalistic indifference, or at worst, willful marketing manipulation regarding the history and origins of these shoes. And it all seemed to stem from one particular problem, a distinct lack of concise information about the true history of the daybreak. So, let's start by taking a look back at where it all started and try to identify why the history of the Nike Daybreak never seems to be set in stone. The Nike Daybreak has appeared in a number of forms since its original release in 1979, and whereas today's retro editions are constructed purely for the lifestyle market, the original Daybreak was, back then, a true technical running shoe. All models, including the Japanese variants, were manufactured in the USA and production ran from 1979 to 1981. Its main selling points at the time were its straight last build and slip last upper, second generation waffle outsole, dual layer EVA midsole and a removable permafoam insole. A first for Nike and a real bonus for runners utilising any orthotics. Nike would also go on to offer these as an aftermarket accessory. Yet, even with all these selling points, the Daybreak would face some stiff competition when it came to market. Not only from Nike's competitors, but actually from Nike themselves in the form of the highly anticipated Tailwind. A shoe which would go on to transform not just Nike, but shoe technology as a whole. However, despite this in-house competition, the Daybreak would actually prove to be a popular shoe on both sides of the Pacific. Only one colourway of the Daybreak was readily available in the USA, the ubiquitous tan and orange colourway, colour palette chosen to depict the tones of the sunrise over the Phoenix Desert. The Japanese market, on the other hand, received three of their own SMUs, and those three additional colourways would help to cement the Daybreak's place in the hearts of the country's runners and ultimately its vintage collectors. And that's pretty much it. After two years of production, the Daybreak met the dusk and ceased to be. Its original colourway would live on with the original Nike Lavadome, but the demise of this popular training shoe would prove to be an annoyance for one of Nike's signature athletes, long-distance runner John Benoit Samuelson. John Benoit Samuelson was synonymous with the Nike Daybreak because the Daybreak's technical configuration suited her running style perfectly. At the time, Nike was aware of both Benoit's disappointments at the discontinuation of the shoe and the trepidation at having to find a completely new training shoe which she would be confident in, especially when returning from injury. So, without informing Benoit, Nike actually went on a worldwide hunt and sourced several pairs from Brazil, ensuring she'd still have a supply for at least the near future. And such was her love of the silhouette that they would actually go on to feature in a TV spot celebrating her record-breaking Boston Marathon victory in 1983, a full two years after the Daybreak had stopped being produced. 
And as a little fact, Benoit actually won that marathon that year wearing a pair of Nike Lady Terra TCs. But it would be a full 26 years before the daybreak would see light again. Well, at least that was true until 2019 when somebody in Nike's marketing department chose to suggest otherwise. <laughs> In 1984, three years after the daybreak had stopped being produced, Joan Benoit would famously go on to win what was the first women's marathon to feature at an Olympic Games. 35 years later, in celebration of that event, and to obviously promote a product tie-in, Nike released the following piece of marketing. The date was 5th of August 1984, marking the first ever women's marathon on the global stage. The day will eternally be remembered for Joan Benoit Samuelson's legendary run to the finish line. Forever changing the world of running for women, JBS took the lead just 14 minutes into the race and never looked back. Crushing 26 miles, Benoit won the pioneering race by 400 metres. On her feet for all 26 miles was the Nike Daybreak. Recognised as the first Nike shoe to incorporate a straight last, Benoit's Daybreak was specifically created for her and featured a nylon upper, an outsole with very specific flex grooves and a plastic heel clip to slow her pronation. So lots of details there, let's have a look. The first Nike shoe to incorporate a straight last. Well, yes, the Daybreak, well, at least the original Daybreak, did feature a straight last construction, but it certainly wasn't Nike's first to do so. That honour, I believe, goes to the LD1000V, released two years prior to the original Daybreak, and although a watershed feature in 1977, this was hardly revolutionary in 1984. Benoit's Daybreak was specifically created for her and featured a nylon upper. Again, yes, these shoes were specifically created for Joan Benoit Samuelson, and yes, they did feature a nylon upper, just not that from a daybreak. The upper which did feature would appear to be similar to that used on several of Nike's early 1980s racing shoes, such as the Zundi Racing Spike, the Skylon Racer, or the American Eagle Salazar. The point being that the upper was sourced from a racing shoe, not a training shoe like the original daybreak an outsole with very specific flex grooves. Now, this is pure marketing filler. The sole in question is actually a ridged waffle sole, which was made from a lightweight, low-carbon rubber, and had already been utilised on several of Nike's long-distance running shoes since about 1981, including the American Eagle, aka the shoe that ate New York. A plastic heel clip to slow her pronation. Again, technically this is correct. The, the configuration of the shoe required the inclusion of this clip for John Benoit Samuelson's known pronation issues. It's also likely that this was actually added because Benoit was returning both from knee surgery and a subsequent hamstring injury. And the midsole? Well, unsurprisingly, this doesn't merit any mention in the advert at all, probably because the configuration is so radically different to that utilised on the original Daybreak. Dawn is a usual dual layer EVA and it's been replaced with a dual configuration midsole with different density units in the forefoot and rear. And it's likely made from Phylon as opposed to typically normal EVA. This setup was, as far as I know, only ever seen on 1984's Nike athlete exclusive training shoes, the White Mesh Eagle, a very rare piece of footwear indeed. So the question is, did the Nike Daybreak really crush those 26.2 miles in 1984 to take Olympic gold? Was history actually made in the Nike Daybreak? Well, no, it wasn't. The only place it did happen was in a marketing person's head. And two things make this very obvious. Number one, the Daybreak was a training shoe, not a racing shoe. And two, if it really did happen, why did nobody mention this before? But it turns out that this isn't the first time that Nike has been loose with the truth about the Daybreak. In January 2007, Nike dropped a limited number of retro heritage runners as part of a collaboration with renowned Japanese designer Junya Watanabe. Apparently Watanabe was looking for more wearable versions of these classic Nike runners. They dropped exclusively at Comme des Garçons Paris and other Tier Zero accounts, and the pack included two colourways of the Daybreak, and would serve as an introduction to Nike's vintage running campaign, which would run throughout the year and beyond. With the Watanabe collabs selling out as instantly as they could in 2007, Nike swiftly followed those up by releasing several other retros of classic running silhouettes, including another 11 colourways of the Daybreak, this time at Quick Strike accounts. A considerable marketing campaign would follow, with Nike creating retro-style pop-up shops, 
using throwback advertising, and even creating a fictional running magazine called the Oregon Runner, which was filled with old school running advice and treated to look like it had been found in a time capsule. Nike also introduced NikeVintage.com, a microsite which paid homage to the Oregon alumni Steve Prefontaine and the 1970s running scene. They also created a series of print ads which were designed to be homage to the apparent reverence being paid to each retro and how Nike had taken the time to recraft them to be just like the originals from 30 years ago. But despite boasting fantastic colourways, 70s grey nylon and funky fat swooshies, Nike's decision to apply a stark vintaging effect to the laces, upper, midsole and outsole of each shoe was met mostly with confusion and often derision from sneaker collectors. And while the Watanabe collabs may have sold out, many shoes from the vintage running pack would actually end up in sales racks because of these aesthetic additions. So what's my issue here? Well, in 2007 the Daybreak wasn't 30 years old. Nike may have stated that it was, but it most certainly wasn't because it didn't even exist in 1977. Its immediate predecessor, the LDV, didn't even exist at that point, a fact weirdly compounded by the inclusion of an LD1000 retro in the same vintage running pack. My second gripe relates to Nike's claims about these retros being accurate almost to the stitch. For the Daybreak at least, this just simply isn't true. So let's go back to two of the main selling points of the original Daybreak from 1979. A slip lasted upper, a removable permafoam insole. Unfortunately, the 2007 retros feature neither of these. The upper construction is now a more typical board lasted upper. What does this change? Well, it impacts the shoe's shape and its wearability, essentially transforming what was a technical running shoe into a lifestyle model and creating a much stiffer piece of footwear. And while the original blue permafoam insoles were partially referenced with the Tier 0 releases, they were made of a more typical foam and not the styrofoam blend of the original. Finally, there's the materials. The nylon and suede are certainly there, but the original full grain leather of the OG's swoosh and back tap have actually been replaced with cheaper synthetics, and the tongue branding is now in cursive text instead of capital text of the original. Over time, Nike's pre-vintaging of further retros would thankfully die off, but they did resurface briefly again a full nine years later, when a hybrid variant of the Daybreak surfaced. <laughs> When Nike released the original Roche Run in 2012, it was an instant smash on the lifestyle market, and for the next four years, Nike would go on to rinse the absolute life out of this simplistic yet hugely popular silhouette. But by 2016, the Roche's popularity had begun to rapidly decline, so Nike mixed things up and by applying the uppers of classic runners to the popular silhouette, brought us the Roche LD1000, the Roche Waffle Racer, the Roche Cortez, and the Roche Daybreak. For the most part, the Daybreak Hybrid consisted of a mesh version of its classic nylon upper sat on top of a Phylon Natural Motion sole unit. Weirdly, they came with Blue Ribbon Sport branded insoles. An odd decision given that Blue Ribbon Sport ceased to be in 1978, a full year before the original Daybreak would actually release. But they did sort of hark back to those original Permafoam insoles from 1979 by again featuring that ubiquitous blue colour. Thankfully, for the most part, Nike avoided the previously seen vintaging effects, but they did make a brief comeback, and of the four classic silhouettes to return as a Roche hybrid, it would seem that only the Daybreak would have the ignominy of receiving this vintage treatment again. Thankfully, some Japanese reverence would help to save this hybrid oddity, only this time would be treated not just one, but two collabs. First we had the Tier Zero Hiroshi Fujiwara collab, which opted for a crisp white sole unit, contrasting navy upper and strategic hits of fragment branding. Then, later that year, we were treated to Rai Kawakubo's Dover Street Market collaboration, featuring an all-black nylon and suede interpretation, its functional starkness only broken by its minimal branding, a trait often associated with Kawakubo's other design work. But ultimately, the Roche Daybreak never really resonated as a model of its own, and is now very much a footnote in the history of the Roche, as opposed to standing out on its own merits. Now we reach 2019 and the latest chapter in Japan's influence on the Nike Daybreak. But even after vintage retros and lifestyle hybrids, Jun Takahashi showed that this silhouette still knows how to make waves. To say that young Takahashi's eye-popping interpretation of the Nike Daybreak silhouette has been divisive would be a considerable understatement. 
His addition of an aggressive heel clip to the vintage Daybreak upper is no less punk than chains on leather or safety pins through denim. It's pure Takahashi. But it's also very much of its time. Ten years ago, this kind of mashup would have been you know, widely perceived as madness, nothing more than a gimmick. Why? Because until recently, when a brand or a collaborator has been given license to apply stark and contrasting concepts to revered models, it's always resulted in some form of backlash in the sneaker community. I was talking to Michael Jordan today, man. He told me if you wear those sneakers one more time, he gonna fuck you <laughs> up. <laughs> but what we see in today's sneaker verse is very different. Hybrid and concept variants of respected silhouettes are no longer met with the sort of aggression we've seen in the past. Um, with the perpetual repetition that we see in sneaker releases today, it should really come as no surprise that attention has turned to more esoteric silhouettes and collaborations, which deliver much required new flavour to the scene. Note how Takahashi's heel design has actually been adopted by Nike and mirrored with their Air Max 90 flyies. Physically, the undercover versions of the Daybreak maintain the nylon and suede board lastic construction of the 2007 Retro, but now feature a softer, single-layer EVA midsole instead of the stacked dual-layer midsoles we see on the original in 2007 Retros. There's also leather lining, that TPU heel cage, and a branded heel flap, adding up to a more modern, stark shape of the silhouette. So, what ingredients gave us this? How did we get from this to this? This melding and balancing of past and present? Well, we know Takahashi's punk at heart, but genuinely I see more at work here. Older heads and those who enjoy Japanese cinema may be familiar with the concept of transhumanism, an idea which has permeated throughout Japanese cinema and underground culture for decades. Look closely at the transhumanism chaos and punk stylings of Sogo Ishii's 1982 film Burst City, or the tech body horror of Shinya Tsukamoto's nightmarish 1989 release Tetsuo the Iron Man, and in there you'll find the melding of opposing elements very much present in Takahashi's version of The Daybreak. Is it any coincidence that his recent spin on the Nike Special Forces book look as if they dropped straight out of transhumanism anime classics, Akira or Ghost in the Shell? His chaotic and angular adaptation of the Daybreak shows that whilst he still respects the architecture of the original silhouette, he's not afraid to take the design language into another realm entirely, and this may be why they resonate today. The first appearance at Paris Fashion Week certainly created a frenzy as everyone rushed to identify what this classic runner with a crazy heel attachment actually was. Hype Beast and Sneaker Freaker incorrectly identified the base silhouette as being a waffle racer, with Soul Supplier embarrassingly prefixing their own waffle racer mistake by questioning if people actually knew their Nike heritage. Eventually, the official name that we know today was released by Nike, but this didn't stop commentators from continuing to reference the wrong shoes. A trend that would sadly continue throughout the year when the Daybreak would return in a more typical form. Ultimately, the success of the undercover Daybreak suffered slightly due to its somewhat unfair comparisons to the Sakai LD Waffles, and the fact that both models dropped at a similar time. But, as a precursor to a wider release of more traditional Daybreak retros, the undercover collaboration should be regarded as a success, providing the required exposure for Nike's full-on onslaught of Daybreak colorways and makeups, which would drop across 2019 and beyond. Nineteen's more traditional Daybreak retros again mirrored the nylon and suede board lastic construction of the 2007 retro, but this time featured the same single layer EVA midsoles seen on the undercover collabs. Gone but certainly not forgotten is the heel cage, and we're back to the more standard features like the OG heel counter shape, synthetic liners, and a gamut of colourways. But despite returning as a hybrid only three years previously, Despite being retroed only nine years previous to that, and despite being connected to some of the greatest streetwear designers ever, today's sneaker media coverage of the Daybreak could, at best, be described as lazy. Some even chose just to make stuff up by plucking apparent facts out of the air in an attempt to just pad word count or come across as knowledgeable. But worst of all, Nike's own marketing department created that very shaky connection between the Daybreak and Joan Benoit Samuelson's victory at the 1984 Olympics just to shift product. And that story has been repeated and recycled without question by established journalists at Runner's World, Complex and a host of other sneaker information sites, sources who really should know better. <laughs>
2020, two different versions of the Daybreak would drop. The first, a more typical retro featuring the same construction as the 2019 retros, and the second, a reconstructed take on the silhouette released under Nike's experimental N.354 line. A combination of original and retro colorways were revisited, and creative license was extended to allow the introduction of more experimental materials such as canvas, textured leathers, and synthetics. Fairly common today, but previously never utilized on a Daybreak model. The N.354 versions again feature the single layer EVA midsole and second generation waffle outsole, but they could actually be classed as a different shoe altogether, with only the eye stay and the toe box truly reflecting the original design of the upper, with the medial and lateral swooshes being removed altogether. One other thing which disappeared is any reference to Joan Benoit Samuelson's victory in 1984, with Nike gradually removing all references of this from their product descriptions on both their website and their sneakers app. Funny that. So that's the basics of the Nike Daybreak from 1979 to 2020. I certainly learned a lot investigating the history of this particular shoe and hopefully I've shown that you know, even just scratching the surface of what was once described as a relatively nondescript Nike runner can actually yield a fascinating backstory if you make the effort. But if all that's not enough to satisfy your curiosity, hit subscribe so you can check out part two, where I take an in-depth look at the actual physical differences between each version of the Daybreak, comparing how the construction has changed so much over the past 40 years. You can also head over to the Sneaker Details website, where everything and anything I could find about the Nike Daybreak has been pulled together and archived for you. It probably won't be until 2029 before we see the Daybreak retro again, and who knows, in that time, Nike may have, you know, made up a little bit more history about the daybreak that we didn't know before. So thanks for joining me, thanks for your time, stay safe, hopefully see you next time.